I hope that everything in the switch section made sense to you. At this point, you should be getting a little bit of a, a knowledge base down in terms of 802.1x. We should have certain terms that were maybe unfamiliar that are slowly becoming familiar. And as we go through the configuration for the wireless LAN controller, uh, it's my hope that this almost starts to become a little bit repetitive. You're like, okay, I know these things. I can figure this out. Um, again, we're going to start off with global radius settings. What is that? Well, talking about what traffic should be authenticated, how and where. Um, are we doing accounting or logging of what's occurred? I'd imagine so. We want to know who attached to our network. So again, we would attach um, those radius servers for both authentication and accounting functions. Uh, when we take a look at 802.1x being implemented in the wireless LAN, uh, this is really the fruits of 802.11i. And remember, the way that this worked was wireless networks came out, we uh, were using this dumpster fire of a protocol called WEP, and basically we all ran out, deployed wireless, and then figured out that it could be compromised in five or 10 minutes. And it's like, well, that's miserable, but we're all really happy with wireless, so when will the fix be here? And the fix for the moment was just to run IPsec over your wireless networks. Like I would have wireless AP, it would connect to a switch, the switch connected to the firewall, firewall would only pass IPsec traffic or only accept IPsec traffic. So you could jump on the wireless, sure, but you had to build a VPN to get through the firewall. Otherwise, you weren't trusted. Um, solutions like this weren't practical for everybody. So eventually we came out with WPA, right? Wi-Fi Protected Access. And this was just an early draft of 802.11i. We weren't really quite there yet. WPA2 is when we say that we were there. This is the fix for wireless security. Now, of course, we've got WPA3 now. But with WPA2, what this did for us is it tied in .1x. We've got this concept of a AAA server. And the real magic is the fact that WPA2 is so much better with handling key management. See, in web, when the user wanted to encrypt traffic and send it into the network, you had data, you had the RC4 algorithm, which is being used to encrypt it, and then you have this super secret key that makes your data secure. This key, they went ahead and used the same key that you used for authentication. So that one key that was the password to get on the network was also the key that you used to encrypt your data. This was just crazy, but it was built without any type of cryptographic review. Nobody knew what they were doing when they built it, and they didn't really ask. So they deployed it, it was a big mess, we finally got it right. And a lot of the way that it, it comes down to being better now, it isn't because we replaced RC4 with AES in most cases. Yes, we did that, but RC4 wasn't that broken. It was the way that key management was uh, being handled, that's what was broken. When we look at WPA2, in pre-shared keyed mode, there's a handshake. Just remember we talked about chat previously with that challenge handshake. This happens in a wireless network. If somebody sees a challenge, they know that the challenge plus your password equals the response. So if they have the challenge and they have the response, you fuzz the middle and that would be the password. So there's attacks, there's even rainbow tables for doing attacks against WPA2 that's in pre-shared key mode. Um, I took a class out about two months ago here in Tampa, Florida, and we took a cruise down uh, the Hillsborough River, and we were running some wireless tools, and we did an audit, and we found that about 95% of the nicer properties right along the water there were all using WPA2 in pre-shared key mode. And maybe 5% of them were using enterprise mode. It means that the majority, the vast majority, could be easily compromised using aircrack. Now the enterprise folks, they're much more secure, but to do so, they had to implement a AAA server. And this is where most people go, I've got to implement what? And they just stick with pre-shared keys. So we'll walk through how complicated or not complicated uh, this is to set up. I don't think it's too bad. Uh, here we are within the uh, management interface for the wireless LAN controller. Uh, easy enough, straightforward, it's just a GUI. Under AAA, under radius, uh, here we are in authentication, and we're adding a new authentication server. The servers have an index or priority, so which one should I try in which order? Here's the IP address, it could be v4 or v6. The shared secret format, the shared secret itself, and the reason for this, remember whenever we do radius, there's a client and there's a server. The server is typically gonna be the identity services engine. The radius client is not the user, that's a supplicant. 
right? The Radius client is really the authenticator. That switch, firewall, or wireless LAN controller that's passing Radius traffic from here to here. So again, this is our client, this is our server. Remember, each has to know about the other one. So each side of this, here we are uh, within the wireless LAN controller pointing to ICE. We say this is the IP address of ICE. This is the password that's the same on both sides. When we send them a message, it's gonna have a checksum, that checksum is built uh, using this. That's how we're gonna know that it's actually coming from the right party. It's also gonna be used to encrypt the password. So if a username and password is sent to an intermediate device, um, that password is going to be relayed. We want to make sure it doesn't go by in clear text. Uh, the rest of Radius, you can see clear text. So if you attach to the wire and you sniff, you'd actually see the AV pairs that are being passed back and forth. Um, this is pretty cool. You can do man-in-the-middle attacks on just about any network, and you can actually get in there and kind of pivot this process um, if you wanted to see what was happening. Below, here's those port numbers. 1812 is the newer one, uh, but you might be in a scenario where your AAA server uh, was deployed a couple years ago. It might be in 1645. Just things to think about. It could be listening on both. So when we configure AAA in the wireless LAN controller, um, we can talk about different things to authenticate. What is it that we want to turn on? Uh, additionally, what things do we want to log? So when we look at logging, this is going to be handled under the accounting section. And we'll talk about what it is that we want to log and where we're going to send those logging messages to. This is the same IP address. This is going to be your ICE or other AAA server. But remember that the accounting happens on a different port. 1812 is for the authentication and authorization. Remember that kind of happens in one fell swoop, like an, an ICMP echo request kind of coming and going real fast or a DNS you know, lookup and response. This is, this is just like that. You threw it like a tennis ball at the wall, it bounced right back to you, and it's got those AV pairs in it, which is really pretty cool. That all happens on 1812. Just pointing out here that 1813 and the legacy port of 1646 uh, are what's going to be used for accounting. If you want to get fancy, remember that IPSec can work in tunnel mode or transport mode. Transport mode is from host to host, so we could actually protect this traffic if we wanted to, our, our accounting logs. So here we are just defining a uh, another AAA server. As we define AAA servers, again, we can just set different index priorities. Uh, each of the servers can go into a group, and then our policies will point towards that group. Now, 802.1x is what we're going to leverage for network authentication. When we set up, and this isn't really a class on wireless, and I'm sure some of you know way, know way more than this, but I don't want to assume that everybody uh, has a background in wireless, so let's talk about it real quick. Um, when we look at an individual access point, that might be above you in your ceiling uh, right now, if you're in a library or a common area, remember that the access point is a piece of equipment that has a radio, or typically multiple radios inside of it. Now this radio is gonna participate in different networks, at least 2.4 gigahertz and five gigahertz. So this is just the space, right? Now what happens, just like with an ethernet switch, the way that we'll use multiple ethernet ports in a port channel to get more bandwidth, we can use multiple radios. And the number of radios within your access point varies based on how much money you spent typically. Uh, the advantage of using multiple radios is, well, just like port channeling, we can use multiple channels at the same time. Not only does it make us more uh, resistant against jamming, which is pretty cool, um, it's also gonna be better uh, with handling interference. You might have a new neighbor that moves in, uh, they have misconfigured wireless, the APs are turned up way too hot, it's creating a bunch of problems. We can see that and intelligently move out of the way. That's kind of nice. Um, well, beyond the frequencies, which are their own kind of concept or, or, or subject or area of, of, of partitioning, um, there's this concept of SSIDs, security set identifiers. And this is what the end users see when they go to join a network. Maybe you see employee and you see guest, or you see corporate, and you see customer, whatever it may be. A single access point can have multiple radios, not just the fact that it's working at different frequencies, 
But the fact that we want to do, in terms of 802.11n, multi in, multi out. To do multi in, multi out, which is like port channels for wireless, we need multiple radios. So we've already got multiple radios and multiple frequencies, but we've also got this logical configuration called security set identifiers. We typically think of that as the name of the wireless network, again, like employee. But what this is gonna do is it's gonna dictate the frequencies that we work on. Maybe employee is only available in five gigahertz. It's possible. Uh, we can also set the authentication method. So maybe the SSID of guest is simply gonna use a web key. And you say, Ryan, that's a horrible idea. And I go, well, it's just for guest access. Uh, that's what we're gonna use. It's simple, it's backwards capable. People can use really old crummy devices here. Um, alternatively, I could have all my guests authenticate with the temporary username and password and implement 802.1x. Just depends on how complex I wanna make this. So what frequencies do we wanna work at, 2.4 or 5? What channels within those frequencies do we wanna work at? What speeds of connectivity do we wanna allow? This access point may allow 1.2 gigabit per second connections, but I might only have a one gig pipe coming into it. So I would wanna rate limit those users much lower. So lots of options that we can kind of tie into our, our logical construct called the SSID. Again, one of those is the authentication type. And this is where I typically say, okay, WPA2 for enterprise, and then for my guest, just regular WPA2 with pre-shared key. And then all we do there is try to change the key as often as we can. So here we are looking at the AAA servers that are gonna support this group. So okay, we're gonna use dot one x that's fine. How are they gonna authenticate? Here we are with our list of servers. Pretty cool, right? For authentication, use 1812. For accounting, use 1813. And we just check these off, server two, server three, server four. Together, those will go into our server group. So under the advanced tab, uh, you'll find that you've got the ability to perform what's called AAA override. If we wanna change things that are already existing on the device, that's what we call override. So remember, the second A in AAA is authorization. When authorization parameters are returned to the authenticator, and this is in the format of radius AV pairs, what do we do when we've got existing information hard-coded on the device and this new dynamic information that just showed up well, if this is enabled, we believe the dynamic information.